Oh, so you don't find makeup. Uh, well, probably most of you know that the amount, I mean, this is a pun on, on this, uh, uh, this business here. Um, the idea was to be able to connect the dots by drawing four straight continuous lines, never lifting the pen from the paper. And the business buzz was thinking outside the box involved being able to take the lines outside of the box to draw the line. The visual box being drawn by the, by the dots. Well, that's, you know, I mean, I, I was thinking more about this box. Now this is, um, uh, by the way, this uh, chickadee is, uh, this is uh, right out of size. So the chickadee would be about that big from even here relative to this size. Anyhow, this is an operative box for chickadees. And the chickadee has to fly to the theater to get food. And it, through uh, the miracle of photocells, we can make them stand on the perch for a while to hear the song and then uh, fly to the theater. He gets food there. That, that thing in the background is a very fancy uh, Japanese speaker of Fostex. Um, the theater we designed so that it wouldn't cut off birds' heads while we were, the first ones we used did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so the idea is uh, you can do operant auditory experiments. You can do them with pigeons, as we heard. You can do them with rats, you can do them with all kinds of animals, and you should. Way more than you do. Because auditory stimuli are just that much easier to manipulate and use in your experiments than visual ones. But that isn't the main point. The point is that for a long time, um, oh, this is our subject. Um, this is the black cap chickadee, and he's singing outside the box. Now, I want to, you notice know, that he is absolutely outside the box. He is in nature. That's where we're going, right? I want to remind you. That's the thing we want to explain. Right? That is, sure it's nice to explain what's going on inside the box, but, and you think, well, eventually, after a while, and with great thought, what we're finding out inside the box will apply outside the box, but I would like it to be easier. I'd like to know that it's going to work. Because we do a lot of work inside the box that I'll be goddamn if I can, and I've done a lot of work inside the box. I can never figure out how I could possibly apply to anything outside the box. That's probably because I was stupid and didn't do it right, but nonetheless, it didn't go there. Now, I want to take a second here, if I can find the cursor. Now, yeah, I got it now. And this is, these are, maybe it won't play. Probably it won't. It's okay. The, the, one, the thing, I, you've already heard a chickadee call and you've already heard a, uh, uh, a, a chickadee song. The song is like that. The song falls in pitch. And the call is chickadee dee dee dee. Now, one throat, one brain produces both. And they're both learned. And our job is to explain how they do it, when they do it, why they do it. And we don't have to think, oh, I wonder what this is going to apply to. We know. We already have our job, you see, to explain nature. And I'm encouraging you to explain nature. You look at nature and you say, gee, I wonder how they do that. OK, now. I'm going to remind you about a few facts about the piano and about uh, music and about natural music. <clears throat> On a piano, the keys are spaced about 6% apart. There is a 6% increase in frequency. And they move in an orderly way, black and white keys alike. And although we talk about a change, in the musical key, we can also talk about a frequency ratio change. And Stu Hull sat me down and explained this to me, otherwise I wouldn't know. 
And I was banging around in, inside the box trying to show how, how animals could do relative stuff. And every time I tried, it was just barely convincing. I was thinking inside the box. But what I want to tell you is that the key thing here is the ratio. You take the lower frequency note, and you put it on the bottom, and the higher frequency note on the top, and that's a ratio. And relative pitch means that notes that have the same ratio are perceived the same. OK? That's what it means. Physics and perception. Um, now, this is how we do it outside of, when we're outside the box. See that green stuff out there? That's nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we want to explain things from. Now, there's a bit of a joke in here. You see that robin sitting up on top of that speaker? It's stuffed. <laughs> it's a joke. They're, these guys are studying chickadees, and, um, and uh, the, that thing that looks like some kind of weapon of war is actually called a shotgun mic, and it's used for uh, highly directional recording. And uh, there are speakers there who are doing playback. Because you can play the sound to the uh, bird in the field, and they'll respond to it. And if you mark off their territory and put the song at the territory border and play it, then the bird will respond to it. And bioacoustics is the science of collecting those songs and calls and analyzing them so you know what the stimulus is. And that's what we do. And then, armed with knowledge of what the stimulus is in nature, we seek to explain why it is as it is and how we perceive it. Okay, now, we recorded a lot of chicken songs, hundreds, in the field from different birds that were all marked so we knew who they were. And this is a kind of specialized spectrogram of a chickadee song. Now you see, this is the energy, fairly pure tonal, in the, uh, in the note. And this is moving from the start to the finish of the song. This is a phi, and you notice that it falls off in frequency. And then, see this stuff in here? I was so green when I started doing this work that I actually thought the note was continuing in this region. That's reverberation. <coughs> in the field, the note can reverberate. And so this is a way that chickens can judge distance. How long does the first note reverberate into the second? But as I said, I was so green I didn't know it was reverberation. Until I got it, I even Wiley who knows more about a bird song than anyone else alive, said, Ron, it's not the note continuing. Anyhow, this is the second note, and you can see that it's, it's lower in frequency with no overlap with the first note. You see? And just to count, discount this because that's reverberation. And you don't see the reverberation from this note because I didn't show it to you. <laughs> is that all all right? Falls off in frequency, then down to this note. Now, Remember, that's in nature. These are the songs, these, these are the, uh, the uh, averages for about 150 birds of this. This is the lower frequency, and this takes a little bit, used to this is the higher frequency. The song starts at the higher frequency, ends at the lower one, right? So what does this mean? Well, at 35, at 3200 hertz, of the lower frequency, then if we come across here, then the note is at uh, the, 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 uh, the higher frequency in the note is at uh, close to uh, 3300 hertz. And if we take this note, um, okay, this one's at 36 in the higher frequency, and you can see <coughs> down here that it's at like 3100 hertz. See, we're counting stuff. Sounds like science to me. We're measuring it. Now, what you do when you plot the notes this way 
is you are showing, now these are, these are several bird songs, and this line going through them is, is, a, is a relative pitch fit based on the ratio, the average ratio in the notes. And the average ratio between the, the end of the P and the beginning of the P note um, is uh, 1.14. <clears throat> and, and the coefficient of, the, oh, the standard deviation around it is, 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 is only about 0 0.01, 0 0.015. Tiny. So in other words, most of the notes, okay, but, um, fall very close to this line because if you multiply the, the, the frequency of the note by the frequency ratio, you get the higher frequency note, don't you? You follow me? So you can, you can, you can make this line simply by predicting what the frequency of the higher note from the lower note will be at several frequencies. I, once I know the frequency ratio, I don't have to look at the data anymore. I can just do those calculations and put the dots on the line and connect them. And the same for that change, the frequency slider of the with that there's no. Just divide, just get the frequency ratio and multiply the first by the second and connect the dots. And then you can fit these as regression lines. Right? And you can ask, how much variability around the line is there? And the answer is, the smallest amount known in nature. These are correlations well over 90%. I'll go over 0.9. Closer to 9, 9 than 9. Okay, now, notice that no optimum conditioning chambers were sacrificed to attain this <laughs> result. Absolutely not. And these are irrefutable proof, irrefutable proof, that, that nobody will ever get to take away from us, that chickadees sing their songs using a relative pitch algorithm. They raise the note, the second note, by <coughs> one point, or the higher frequencies, uh, by 1.14 over the lower note. Now, the question, do, I don't care how much wrestling inside the outward box you ever did, these are the facts. By looking outside the box, we now know. Do, so can songbirds use relative pitch? Why, yes, they can. And you say, well, but that's in their song. I mean, what about their perception? Well, I, I can test the perception all kinds of ways. But one important thing to know about songbirds is they all learn their song. So if they couldn't hear the relative pitch change, they couldn't do this. Someone pointed out that songbirds can imitate. Well, that's how they got this song. And if they couldn't perceive the relative pitch change in song, they couldn't do this. We did, as I said, no often conditioning chambers had to be sacrificed. No heads had to be banged against walls to find out that songbirds perceive relative pitch and that they use it in a biologically important way. Don't forget that lesson. Now, those some of you are older that have never been outside the box, you don't have to worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> some of you that are younger and have been out, and have a choice sometimes to be outside the box. Sometimes it pays to actually go and look. Now, Galileo, this is, I don't know if the story is true or not, he's the guy who first decided that the, after the telescope was in, invented, that it might be useful to, as an astronomer, to look through it. <laughs> it's true. It had been invented, but no, one, no astronomer thought it was important to use it in order to make decisions about where the planets were or anything like that. Now, it is said that in a discussion on philosophers, the, the question arose as to how many teeth a horse had. <clears throat> and he, in frustration, finally said, now remember, this is in medieval times, he said, let's go out in the street, find some horses, and count how many teeth they have. That's the beginning of science. So all I did is I went out into the street, and I counted 
Now, the, this is a, a bird called a fury. And uh, as Bob Cook pointed out, they have a wonderful melodious song. They're not uh, they're all closely related to chickens. Um, and what you can see is, by golly, their song cluster around the frequency ratio too. Now you see this other line here? That line is constructed by stubbornly insisting um, that their song is not relative. <coughs> So I take the average difference in frequency between the two notes as a number rather than as a percentage. And I simply add the lower, you know, that number to the lower frequency, and that gives me this line. Now what you can see is that the line is, is an overestimate at the lower ranges and, um, and, and, and an underestimate at the higher ranges, which is exactly what should be true if the arithmetic version of the law, you know, predicting pitch, was false. You see? If it's true, then it ought to increase like this, but it ought to be constant like this if, if it's an arithmetic law. Now again, absolutely no offer conditioning changes were sacrificed to show that in varies the the, the, uh, the pitch change in the song is relevant. And the question, and by the way, we have two or three other species in which this is true. The question is forever answered. You will never have to answer the question again. No one will be wrestling back and forth on the soccer field of associative learning uh, about whether songbirds have relative pitch. And this is the lesson for the young scientists here. When you want to answer questions, link what you see outside of the box to what you study inside the box. Uh, this is just a summary of what I said before. As I said, we found relative pitch in plain sight. Anybody could have seen it. Didn't, no fancy tools needed. Now, Let's talk about how we find uh, the answer to the why questions in, in nature. And I stole this from Nicholas Timber, <laughs> which is a great source to steal from. Um, he says causation, which includes stimulus parameters and neuroscience parameters. Timber didn't think much of psychological explanation. I think less of it than that. <laughs> Okay, it, developmental determinants. Well, animals grow up. And in the process, their, 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 their brain develops. And in that process, things change. So that is a very important determinant of behavior development. So it's one that we should pay attention to. Then there are adaptations. That is, how, why is it that, you know, why is that behavior maintained? Why does it exist generation after generation? Now, it's not enough to say that it's just adaptive. And no just so story, some, you know, Uncle Remus kind of invention of, of why we have rain will suffice. You have to do the manipulations. Some misunderstanding about how biologists use the word adaptation. And you have to actually have evidence. Not okay to make it up. <laughs> Although I will tell you that they can make mistakes too. I have an example that I think is absolutely wonderful. Okay, um, there are anthropomorphic errors in understanding vision. We look at other animals and say, well, they got eyes, we got eyes, they must see like we see. Not so. Chickadees, pardon me, all birds see into the UV. All birds see into the UV. And it had been supposed, it had been supposed that based on the evidence we had, that of the very large number of songbird species, that most of them were monochromatic. That is, they had the same um, coloration in both sexes. 
And in fact, there were now, there were elaborate theories about why that was true. And, and, and then the theories of, you know, well, you know, how kind of adaptation it would be. Well then, a very bright, clever fellow started doing some measurements on these species. He took the kinds of pictures that let the UV in, the ultraviolet light in, and he measured the amount of UV in the light, in, the, in, in various locations on the birds, and guess what? 90% of the birds that are supposed to be monochromatic are not. They're dichromatic. The males and females have different coloration. So, to give you an idea just how bad it can get, you have a theory to explain something that doesn't exist. Now, if you ever had an argument against anthropomorphism, that would surely be it. I'm just going to move ahead because I want to take two on. Uh, we, here we answer two uh, questions, one about causation and one about, uh, about development. And the first one is, uh, does a constant frequency ratio help? perception. And the other is, is early learning about song important to pitch perception? Now we're back in the box again. Um, and uh, I want you to uh, pay attention to these figures. Um, imagine having 27 tone pairs. So they go, and they all fall in pitch or, or are the same in pitch. So these, the ones with a frequency ratio of one, the two tones are the same frequency. Here, the second tone falls from the first by a ratio of 1.12. Here, that's two, two piano tones. And then, and this is by four piano tones. Now, it's very easy for you to pick out the ones that are positive because I colored them, right? They're in the middle here. Well, well down here, and by the way, if you hear these, you have no trouble picking out the ones that are at 1.12. That's because we got relative pitch. But if I ask you to memorize this set, where the, 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 uh, the 9 out of 27 uh, pairs that are, um, uh, that are positive, that is, we're flying to the figure will get your food, in this case, they're randomly chosen with a few restrictions so they don't come off right in the road. Um, they, uh, you can see that there, you'd actually have to memorize the absolute pitch of the tone pairs together. Okay, now we had uh, a small number of isolate uh, uh, chickadees around, and of course, isolates because they didn't hear any males sing, uh, don't sing themselves, the males don't sing themselves, and these are the male subjects. So we got some normal males and some isolated males. And here are some results. These are S plus uh, node pairs and S minus node pairs. This is in the ratio group. This is after 10 sessions. So it's a difference in favor. Uh, now this is the pseudo ratio group. They're memorizing some of them. Now this is the ratio group, but isolates. They're not doing any better than the than the uh, pseudo, the group that has to memorize. Now we went on for a lot more training uh, until we could get discrimination ratios in the 80s. And uh, this, this took about eight, eight, eight or 9,000 trials. This took uh, 32,000 trials for birds to learn the pseudo ratio. That, that's memorizing um, the pitches of the two notes in the song. The pre the human beings can't do this at all. Can't even get close. Now the pseudo ratio group took 64,000 trials, pardon me, I still do, with, with a ratio in it. Clearly the ratio was not helping. So we come to two conclusions from these data. One is that the ratio really is perceptually important to the group. It helps them recognize the songs. Secondly, well, secondly, they have a pretty good absolute pitch too, but you know, nothing like, I mean, vastly better than humans, but they still use relative pitch. And finally, development matters. If, you, if you're isolated from the opportunity to learn about relative pitch when you are young, you just don't have the ability. 
Now it'd be nice if we had a pseudo racial group in these guys too. But you know, we can only get a hold of so many birds that have been isolated for this experiment. It's a flaw. Um, so those are our conclusions, which I already discussed, so I'll move quickly on. Um, and now, um, so I had some advice to you, right? Look outside the box and use Tinbergen's four whys. You know, those are the questions you need to answer. Um, the next one is to have multiple alternative hypotheses. Do not test order, usually the Viscola Wagner theory or somebody's neural net model, against chaos. Too many experiments fail that way. Now your supervisor may not let you do this. You may have to wait until you get to design your own experiments. But insofar as you design your own experiments, make them have multiple alternatives. For every way that the experiment can come out, there should be a plausible alternative to continue testing. I'm so keen on that that my students didn't know that you could have busted experiments until I talk to other experimenters. Now, of course, we had busted experiments in the sense that we, didn't, we couldn't get them to work. We couldn't get the training to work or something. But we never had a busted experiment in the sense that we collected the data that we had confidence in, and it, it didn't have a meaning. Multiple alternatives. <coughs> Um, I'm going to show you an example from absolute pitch processing in birds and mammals. Now, you've already seen these data. Basically, there are 40 tones, and we divide, and they're 120 hertz apart. The first five are positive, the next five are negative, the next five are positive, and in the other group, it's the other way. And they start at a little under 1,000 hertz. Now, it would be, it's kind of simple if you just play the tones in order and positive five, positive five, negative, you just count. You don't even have to pay attention to what the frequency is. But we don't do that, do we? Instead, we got this big bag of tones and we reach in and randomly pick one. And then we pick another until we've gone through all 40. Then we do it again. So there's no cue from the previous trials as to what tones you're going to get. And it's really important to see that the zebra finches, uh, they're, they're responding uh, virtually, it exa almost exactly follows the positives and negatives. That is, their perception of pitch, their ability to group these tones is awesomely accurate. This is an accuracy in the 90s. This is correct. These are humans. Um, they kind of get the fact that the highest tones uh, are negative and the lowest ones are positive and vice versa here. And that's about it. That's what they get. Now there are all kinds of explanations of these difference in results. So what we got, what we got here are alternative hypotheses. And what are they? Well, only humans have inferior AP. And I've heard people talk about that. Well, because we have relative pitch, and we have these big brains, and we're different from those dirty old animals. Oh, OK. Um, the other one is, only songbirds have uh, superior absolute pitch. Uh, or some mammals and some birds have, depending on adaptation. Or birds have superior AP and mammals do not. Now, we'll, link, we'll, we'll even throw into that a few specialized adaptations at, on yet specified but no more than a, a handful going both ways of species that would be allowed to have a special adaptation. Now, what I'm saying here, birds have superior AP, mammals do not, is basically birds have feathers, yeah, and mammals have hair, fur. That is, it's kind of like that. That's a possibility. Yeah? Is have beaks, more or less, almost all, a few special adaptations. 
Now we don't. <laughs> the reason for this could be complicated, but that, those are the possibilities. And I'll show you where we are so far. Okay. Um, these are these you see. And Jerry Cohen and I collected these data with his uh, wonderful students. And uh, what you can see is that to a first approximation at least, uh, the data for rats are highly similar to those for humans. And it isn't as if they can't, rats can't solve simpler problems with, relative, with absolute pitch. They can, which we'll come to in a minute. But the main point is that rats and humans, and excluding the fact that some humans seem very rat-like, especially if they climb in the administrative ladder. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all have that experience. If some of you are deans, I apologize. Uh, but the main point is um, that, um, that rats and humans are not closely related. Except those few we just talked about. <laughs> rats are, yeah, rats are nice. Uh, okay, so that's so so we can we can pretty well get rid of the hypothesis that only humans have uh, have mediocre absolute pitch. And probably I'm just guessing because we haven't done that many species yet. But we're probably going to find a lot of mammals with a different mean. Uh, now, uh, uh, this is cutting to the chase. All songbirds that we have tested have superior AP and so do parrots. Pigeons have AP that is nearly as accurate as that of songbirds and parrots. Pigeons, in case you didn't notice, are not songbirds. You do not learn their calls or songs, although they're interesting, they don't learn them. And our tests show that at least the best of them in our experiments can do about as well as some songbirds. So the experiments support the idea that birds have superior AP and mammals do not. So we have a ton of hypotheses. We can keep testing them, and we should. But you see, it's almost impossible to get a busted experiment out of this. Nature, science, proceeds in a forward direction, not back and forth across the scrum. <clears throat> it seems to in some of our efforts. And I didn't invent alternative hypotheses. <coughs> the molecular geneticists did. And I think they moved quick. I was impressed. I use them. Not really as well as they do. But I recommend you use them, and you'll move quick too. And the junior members here, I think they'd all like to do that. Wouldn't you like to find a lot of stuff out that no one could take back from you? I hope so. Okay, this is just a brief sample. These are, these are. <laughs> these are three individuals. These are not group data. They're three individuals. Um, this is one zebra finch, one pigeon, the best one. And believe it or not, this is the best human. And I, I, I couldn't resist the, okay, only this guy's mom could think he had after they did. Um, okay, I, uh, another very important thing to do is to have positive controls. What is a positive control? Well, in, in, neuro, in, in, in neuropharmacology, if, if you're going to study a transmitter um, and you've got a standard drug that we know affects the transmitter in a particular way, and you've got a new <coughs> technique, well, you use that standard dose of that standard uh, drug to demonstrate that your technique would generate the result that is expected if the standard drug was used. Then you start using the wild card uh, pharmaceuticals that the drug companies come up with by the thousands using uh, computer programs to generate the drugs and their suspicions about what they do. And you've got the positive control to protect you from an inappropriate test. Do you understand? We need positive controls 
so that we don't conclude in a case where it would be almost impossible to demonstrate a positive result, that the negative result we achieved is due to the drug, when it in fact could be the procedure. Do you see? Now, when you, comp when you compare species that are wide apart, like humans and rats, or pigeons and, and songbirds, they're far apart. And there are so many influential jumps. Like I, as I have said in print more than once, look, birds have wings, they fly to the theater. Humans have fingers, they push the keys. It's a big difference in that neural structure that goes in between these large two. So you need positive controls that assure you that you could have gotten a positive, the, the, the proper result, if it were attainable. Now let me show you what I mean. This case, we're looking at a simpler discrimination. It's, it's 27 tones, but there are only three ranges. And the tones are farther apart. It's an easier task. It uses tones. What this tells you is the reinforcers are right. The tones are discriminable. Uh, the rats aren't doing as well as, as the humans or the Finches, but they're doing the task. You can't, you can't say that the task would fail to jet with, with 40 tones and, and, and so forth, that it would fail to generate some discrimination if the birds were capable of pulling it. You see? That would be nice to get this result better, but it's good enough so that you can be reasonably confident. Let's see if I can get this one. There. You'd be reasonably confident that, it, that, that if the birds were capable, that they'd show something more like this than this. Because we have a positive control. They're not deaf, the reinforces the reinforces effective, they process tones. It's just that they're not. Do you see what I mean? We can't bust the experiment if we have a good positive control. Experiments are hard to do, and graduate students know that better than their faculty supervisors have long forgotten just how much work it is. Get positive controls. Convince your supervisors to get them so you don't bust experiments. And when you finish up and have a life of your own, always run them. Okay. Now, I'm going to move to the last comment in, uh, in this part. I've got a very short part after this. Don't worry. Another five minutes or eight minutes and we'll be out of here. Um, okay. Anticipating reviewers' comments. This is your most important job. <laughs> because peer review is the very essence of science. And if you started doing an experiment without thinking about what the reviewers are going to say about it, you're making a horrible error. One of the things they can say is, this experiment is so screwed that I don't want it in the journal. So you've got to answer these questions. Why did you do it that way? Now sometimes you say, I don't know. <laughs> well, you better be prepared to know why you did it that way. And you better have a good, clear, logical way of having done it. Otherwise, the reviewers are going to kill you. And, and the people that are reading it are going to say, oh, this is awful. OK, is your measurement convincing? Well, it should sound right, and it should be based on measurement that other people have used. If it's got some funny curves in it, or we only did it when we're looking away, or you know, all these other excuses, you're in trouble. If it takes more than one sentence to describe the measurement, you're in trouble. Now, when you're writing your description as a method, everything has to add up. If you say, I use 60, OK, we use 14 stimuli in all, six of them were of this kind, and seven of them were of the other kind, <laughs> you're in trouble. You have to go through and make sure they always add up to 14. And the same with the number of subjects you've got. 
Everything must add up. If not, a reviewer will come back, and if you can't explain the difference, you will burn. And so you should. So you have to be really careful. And you're doing it in advance of the review. Okay, your figures and your stats should be convincing and simple. Use the simplest, ignore the advice of the statistical wizard at your university. Put your hands right over your ears. Use the simplest possible designs and use parametric statistics wherever you can. Why? Because they're vastly more powerful. And your statistician buddy, he's never run an experiment in his life or her life. <laughs> if they have, it's with 4,000 undergraduates. They don't know what sweating over 10 subjects is. You use parametric statistics, and there are tricks that we can explain to you about how to be, I mean, without, I don't mean they'll do The tricks that I'm making, that reassure you that the parametric statistics is generating good results. Never use any of these bright idea statistics that make it four times harder to get a significant difference. Because the fact is we use very low variability techniques. And from time to time, we replicate them and replicate them. We know they're right. It isn't like the kind of data that I mean, some of our colleagues collect where they, they got undergraduates that are looking out the window while they're filling out the application for the checklist. Um, so just be careful. Don't make type don't, don't make type two errors, but for God's sakes, don't make type one errors. I mean, data is too hard to come by. And you want to have a career. <laughs> now, the last one is the most important. <laughs> I'll give you one story here. I'm taking too much time here. Now, this is my favorite story about reviewers. I had a reviewer who complained because I had failed to cite a paper that she had not yet published. <laughs> and she made me put it in. <laughs> oh, that's the other thing. You always do what the reviewer said. <laughs> That is, as long as it doesn't involve breaking the laws or breaking your moral code in some way, you always do what the reviewers say. And you never say yes, but. Because then the editor will send the paper out again, probably to the same reviewer. And then you'll burn. <laughs> and remember, you have a limited lifetime. I'm 70. I'm more conscious of that than you are. You only have so many times around with each paper all those papers. And if you're going to make that forward progress we've been talking about through science, you better not mess with these people. <laughs> if they want you to cite their paper, do it. <laughs> Does this all make sense? Okay. Now, one last thing, and I'm going to go through this really quickly. <clears throat> writing. You will spend the rest of your professional life writing. You are doomed to write a lot. You must. And you don't have to like it. And the other thing is, don't get confused that our, that our writing is like poetry or something. Our writing is like brick laying. <laughs> okay? Faulkner and, and Margaret Atwood, they're sculptors. We're brick layers. Just keep it simple, straightforward, follow the rule. Get Strunk in White, it's a tiny book. People say, oh, it's an old hat. Well, E.B. White was the world's greatest editor. He edited the New Yorker magazine for, for six generations. Which is, as you probably know, the best magazine ever written in the English language. And it is because of his insistence on good writing. So you take, you get it, and people complain, well, you know, there are a bunch of rules in there. How am I supposed to keep? You memorize them, that's how. Over the first three or four papers you write, you memorize all the damn rules. There are only a few dozen. Like, 
How do you add the possessive? You know, where, where, where do you put the apostrophe? Do you add an S or don't you? That should not even cause a blink in your brain. Once you've written four or five papers, you should know that. You should know all of these rules by then, and it isn't hard. It's a tiny book. I mean, it is this thick. It's on the internet now. I mean, you can print it out. It's nothing to read. Okay, here are some of the rules he says. Leave, if you leave yourself out of the writing, it will be dry and boring. If things were done to animals, instead of, I did this and then I did that, or we did this and we did that, it will be incredibly boring. I mean, you don't have to worry about citations. People will fall asleep in the middle of the paper. <laughs> Watson and Crick's first paper. Here we demonstrate for the first time. Kind of makes you tingle just to hear it. Here we demonstrate. Now, it was demonstrated by, or how, or whatever, for, you know, use personal pronouns and active sentences. Now, a lot of your faculty advisors will think this is some kind of terrible thing. But if you can get them to let you do it, do it. It's so much less painful, it's so much easier, and you will feel like a human being doing the writing. <laughs> what I say is, do not confuse writing properly with being objective. What that will tell you is that if you put yourself in, it isn't objective. I'm sorry, you can write objectively when you are in it. But if you take yourself out of it, you're guaranteed to be writing badly. Okay, and you just got too much writing to do to write that. <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, right from Shrunk and White. Make definite assertions. Avoid tame, color, hesitating. It was, you know, it, it apparently, you're certainly not allowed to use more than one qualifier in a sentence. <laughs> and one is really too many. You know why you put all those qualifiers in? Because you're afraid you might be wrong. Well, don't be afraid to be wrong. Science progresses when you're wrong. Change your mind. And isn't it wonderful when you were right? Uh, <clears throat> express coordinate ideas in a similar form. That is now one of the hardest things we have to do is to say, uh, I did this, and then I did that, and then I did this. Well, notice I use the same form for all three sentences, right? That's what you must do. You must write the three parts of this idea in parallel. Then <coughs> you will understand what you did the first time through. Because if it takes the, the reader three, two, two or three times to get through your sentences, and, and that happens for, uh, for a page, they're going to throw the journal right. Well, they won't throw the computer that they're reading it on across the But you get the idea, they're just not going to. They're just not going to do it. It's too painful. Now, these are not tough rules. I'm just an average guy, and I could learn them. <laughs> now, the publication process. <clears throat> this is my last set of points. Don't be intimidated. Learn what the editor's letter means. I've had junior faculty bring letters to me and say, they trashed my paper. The editor hates it. And in fact, it's, it's a standard resubmit, re revise and resubmit letter, which unless you're walking on water is what you get. <laughs> because if editors say, we will take your paper, provided you can use revisions, then there are six lawyers coming down their throat afterwards when they say, uh, no, we won't take it. And for the reason is that you didn't do the revisions, or when you did it, it became obvious that your paper was really awful. <laughs> uh, so revise and resubmit, that's about as best as you can get. Most people don't know that and they get discouraged. Learn how to respond to the reviewer's comments quickly and succinctly. You have to write more than a sentence to handle a reviewer's comment, you're in trouble. Keep writing it until it's less than a sentence. You've got to write a paragraph, 
you have endured indeed to you. Uh, learn how to respond to the, okay, I said that. Uh, and finally, learn to take advice. Do not like, oh, I can't do that, or I don't want to do that, or whatever. The reviewers rarely, ex except for wanting you to cite their papers, they don't really mean you any harm. <laughs> they want your paper, they want it all to work. And when they say they don't understand something, it's because they really don't. So just get on with it, make the changes, quit grumbling, make them get on with it, and, and don't take very long to do it. Because mainly, if they notice a flaw, so will everybody else that reads it. They do not pick rocket scientists to be your reviewers. I know, because they sometimes ask me. Um, they're, you know, they're, they just pick working scientists to read it. And they don't understand it, or they think there's a real flaw there. There is. So just get on with it and fix it. And quickly. Finally. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, Tom Zenthal and, and uh, one of his students, Andrea, who worked on the Fission Project with me. Don't forget to have fun. Thank you. Noted that. 